Thank you so much for inviting me to be here um, today. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Bob, and, and thanks <coughs> for the leadership. Um, I, it's it's 14 days until um, the United States presidential election. It feels like one of the most consequential um, elections of our lifetimes. In many ways, it feels um, in a lot of ways like democracy itself um, is on the ballot. And so I feel um, um, I'm really honored to be here and, and have a chance to talk with all of you uh, about what role civics education plays at this critical moment in our democracy and this critical moment in our history. And this surge of young people that we are seeing um, across the country who wanna be involved in public life. And I just voted, I early voted last Thursday and um, I've been to this polling location and, and voted there a million times and I'm almost always um, one of the youngest people in line. And on Thursday, the, the line was two hours long and I was definitely one of the oldest people in line. And so I think that we are really seeing um, a, a sea change happen. So it's such a great time to talk about civics education. I am um, an education journalist. I've been writing about what happens inside classrooms for about 10 years for national outlets. And um, uh, exactly, almost exactly a year ago, I published a book called Building Better Citizens, which is about um, the civics education revival that's happening in schools. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about how I stumbled upon writing about civics education. I didn't know that much about it. Um, when I started, but I wrote an article for Edutopia in the spring of 2017 because I had been hearing from teachers that in the run-up to the 2016 election, that a lot of the really uncivil behaviors that we had seen among adults, they were seeing between kids at school. And they were concerned, and I, I would even say they were, they were alarmed. And they said, you know, what we really need is we need to bring back civics education. And I said, well, wait a minute. Are we not teaching civics education in schools? Because I really didn't know that. Um, and so through some research and reporting, I discovered that since we are not teaching civics education in schools, especially in any organized and systematic layered way. And we haven't been doing it for about 60 or 70 years. And so um, in my research, I discovered that civics education was the reason for starting the American public school system um, that Horace Mann and, and his group in Massachusetts said like, look, you know, we need schools for everybody and we don't necessarily need intellectuals, but we do need people who understand democracy and who understand their rights and responsibilities as citizens. And if they don't, if we don't do that, the union will never hold together. And so America really put a lot of focus and a lot of purpose into civics education um, and educating for citizenship as its core mission until about the second half of the 20th century. And so then um, things really started to fall off in the second half of the 20th century. And there are quite a few reasons for that. You know, one is schools changed their core mission and they started um, being more concerned about college and career than about educating for citizenship. Um, the uh, you know STEM education got a ton of investment. A lot of this had to do with competing globally with other countries. And when a lot of investment went into STEM subjects, a lot of that went away from um, history and geography. And then the third, and then the and the very most consequential is the school reform movement of the late 1990s and the early 2000s. The school reform movement's obsession with testing um, reading and math put a lot of pressure on schools and a lot of pressure on teachers to devalue and basically get rid of subjects like social studies, especially in elementary school, when those reading and math scores were the most important. So this is all stuff that I discovered. So then of course, the next question was, well, what are we gonna do about it? Like, what is the civics education that's happening now? These teachers who are so concerned about it. Well, what I found out was that there was really, this was in, 2017, early 2018, a grassroots movement um, by schools and by educators to bring civics back to the classroom. But this civics is was not your grandmother's civics. This was very much tooled for um, the 21st century, not only to address um, the challenges that we are facing now, but also because the kids have changed so much. 
And so when you look at Generation Z, the teenagers who are in high school and early college now, they are the most racially and culturally diverse generation in American history. They are the most digitally connected generation. Um, they get 100% of their information about the world from their smartphones. And the third thing that I found that I also was, you will not find surprising, is that most young people grow up in like-minded bubbles. Their neighborhoods, their communities, their schools, there are often places where everyone thinks and votes alike, and they don't get to hear a lot of diversity of thought. So the, this new civics had to address these young people and also these new issues that we had. And one of the most basic issues we have is a really low level of civic knowledge. Young Americans do not know that much um, about America. And one of the most disturbing things that I found out was, you know, this survey that's taken every few years called the World Values Survey, that they found that American young people, um, ages 18 to 24, only a third of them believe that it is absolutely essential that they live in a democracy. And about only one third of young people and free and fair elections, something that is really important to them. So one of the things that we have to consider is the, at the most basic level that many young people don't understand what our country is about. So we're not even talking about high level civics concepts of understanding how the government passes law. We're talking about that they don't understand what kind of country we live in. So when we think about civics education, we have to think about going back to the very basics. And so I'm gonna share with you like four um, of the biggest trends that I have seen in schools, um, like this new civics that's coming back and what issues that, um, that they're trying to address. So the first one is um, a really, a much stronger emphasis on US history in the early grades. And there's a real um, cognitive science research backing to doing this. So what they found was when they took social studies out of elementary schools, that um, knowledge works like Velcro in your brain. So in order to understand the higher level concepts of US history and civics that you get in middle school and high school, you have to have some kind of knowledge foundation for that new knowledge to stick to. So when we got rid of elementary school, US history, we got rid of that knowledge base. So that's why we see so many young people struggling um, in history um, in, in middle school and high school. And so many of them leave without understanding the basic concepts. So one of the main things that's happening is kind of a knowledge-based history curriculum that is going into elementary schools. And I think this is undeniably a very good thing. Um, one of the things that you know upset me the most about my own kids is that they would get to middle school and they don't even know where a lot of the states are. Like, you know, how can you understand things that happened in your country if you don't know all the, the places in your country? So, um, so, uh, so that's one trend. Um, a second trend that I feel like might be the very most important is um, addressing how to read the internet, so media literacy. So I, I spoke with um, Sam Weinberg, who is uh, the head researcher at the Stanford History Education Group, and that he has spent several years um, uh, researching how middle schoolers read the internet. And what he has found is, is so incredibly disturbing. Um, the vast majority of them have absolutely no way of being able to tell the difference between a news article and an advertisement or an opinion article and a fact check news article. They also really struggle with um, figuring out if an image is real or not, or where that image came from. And I mean, I think we all know that like, I'm thinking of my retired parents, that adults are struggling with this as well. So fake news is a huge problem for our country. And Weinberg um, told me very honestly, if we do not address this in schools immediately, we will absolutely take democracy down. And I think that we are seeing that happen now is that you know, depending on what um, our internet algorithm feeds us, that you could be living in an entirely different factual reality. So media literacy is just one of the most important things. But what I learned was a lot of schools are really trying to address this, but a lot of media literacy programs 
um, aren't based in evidence. So we are not sure if they work. And so one of the reasons that I write a lot about Weinberg and about Stanford is because they have um, a media literacy curricula that is backed by evidence and they know that it works. It's called civic online reasoning and it's free. And um, Stanford provides it and it is um, a, a wonderful curricula that we know it's actually gonna move the needle um, for young people. Um, so the third trend is um, teaching kids um, how to tackle polarization by using civil discourse. Um, <laughs> I think that this is something, I think we could all use a class in civil discourse at this point, but schools are really trying to address this with young people and teach them how to, um, be with people and how to talk with people who disagree with them. And there's um, some really good research that shows that schools can play a key part in doing this and that it's really good for kids. And I talked to a lot of teachers who are very nervous to talk about hot button political topics in the classroom and that is totally understandable. But the research is showing us that a well-planned conversation with a well-trained teacher helps kids not only become um, more politically engaged when they're older, they're also, um, they know more about, uh, about current events. And so one of the, um, one of the programs that I saw that just, I, I just love, and I have to talk about um, was here in Nashville, Tennessee. There's a librarian named Amanda Smithfield who has started a, a project called Project Civ America, and it's for project civility. And so in her library once a month, she gathers a huge group of kids, a hundred kids show up. Of course, now they're all doing it all online, but they show up and she picks the most contro controversial topic in the news. And she has everyone sit down and they have to read two articles about it. And then they have to discuss the topic and they identify themselves. They put their stickers on that they're Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or whatever. And um, what she is teaching them to do is first of all, to learn that if someone disagrees with them that they will not melt and that th it is okay to hear someone else's perspective. And the second thing that she's teaching them is how to have an argument with facts and how to support your argument with facts. And I got to be a part of several of these discussions with the teenagers and it was so exciting because what they found was that kids who are totally on polar opposite ends uh, of an issue realized when they started really talking to each other that they have a lot more in common and a lot more agreement than they thought. And so um, I see that programs like that have a lot of promise. Um, and the final one I wanna mention, I also think this one has a lot of promise is action civics. There's a lot of curricula popping up for middle and high schoolers. Action civics is having kids identify a problem in their community and teaching them how to leverage local government to address that issue. And this is not like um, we're gonna pick up, you know, our campus needs trash pickup. That is not what this is. These are serious issues. So um, young people address things like climate change, immigration, policing, really big issues that they see in their own neighborhoods and that um, they're being taught in classrooms how to go to the local government. And then through that, they realize you know, how easy it is to, to talk to your local representatives, number one, and number two, how much control your local government has over your life. Um, and so, so that, you know, I, I think that that has a lot of promise and that action civics curricula is really growing. So I think in the next few years, what'll be really interesting to me is to see um, if any of these work, you know, like I said, we have this massive influx of youth engagement here in America right now, I think, Civics education has an opportunity here to, to deepen that engagement and, and, you know, and send them into a lifetime of, of civic engagement, so. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, the relevance of this is just palpable, right? I mean, there's yeah. each, each day here. Yeah, and, thank you. Um, yeah. Sorry, Bob. I would just add before you jump in there. I, Holly, I was trying to keep track. I probably didn't do a great job, but for anyone who's listening in terms of attendees or panelists, I tried to note all of the resources in that oh, document thanks. there. So feel free to update it too. But yeah, thank you for sharing all of those. Okay. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. So now for, now for some civil discourse. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody on the panel? Welcome to start. Uh, 
Um, does anybody, I would just, I mean, I'm a journalist, so it's, of course, I always ask questions, but is anybody seeing in their schools that um, the teens are particularly excited or interested in the election? Are they seeing um, a surge of maybe not in Switzerland, um, but that um, are you seeing kids who are um, very interested in what's going on? Um, I, I, so I would actually like to share my personal experience. Um, and I, I read about this in uh, one of your articles where you kind of talked about the responsibility of parents. So not just educators, but also, you know, what uh, responsibilities do parents hold in kind of ensuring that their kids are being civically active, right? Um, so I grew up in a household where, so I was uh, actually immigrated uh, with my whole family when I was nine years old. And uh, my parents were only American citizens when I was in high school. So up until then, I didn't really grow up in a household where like, you know, I was able to witness my parents go and vote or, you know, be politically active. So I wasn't really kind of exposed to that environment. And uh, I mean, in my school itself, like I, I don't think there was like that push to kind of make sure that we, you know, we were aware of like what was going on in our country. I mean, we had history class and social studies is my favorite subject and I loved American history, but, um, and then I came to college and I was a pre-dental student, right? So I didn't really kind of think about voting. And I first voted uh, when I was a freshman in college. And I remember being really nervous to go to the polls because I didn't know the process. I didn't know, you know, like what to do. Um, and someone had to walk me through it. So. I think um, you bring up a great point where, um, like, you know, we, we need to be exposed to it throughout the process so that we're like comfortable because I didn't really have much to say. Or when someone would ask me, you know, what are your thoughts on this? I would just say, yeah, I'm not politically active or, you know, I don't have much to say. It's because I wasn't really exposed to it and I didn't have much knowledge where I felt comfortable enough to kind of actually express my opinion. So uh, yeah, I definitely just wanted to kind of share my personal experience because I didn't grow up in a household and it was only until college where I actually started reading news and, you know, started listening to podcasts to kind of expose myself so I can, you know, I guess be well equipped to hold these opinions and share it with others because if I didn't have the knowledge and if I wasn't exposed to it, I wouldn't be comfortable. Um, so I would just say, you know, I, I don't really have much to say because mm -hmm. I didn't know much about it. I mean, this is just, this is so interesting to talk about is what role, there's so much research that shows that, you know, parents are in many ways, kids first and most important civics teachers because you can take your kids with you to vote. And, and, and I've heard from a lot of young people, something that I'd never really thought about is that even the process of going into a polling place can be intimidating. And so like, why can't high schools um, have a simulation for kids and have them practice voting? Tell them what they need ahead of time. Um, you know, take them to a, a field trip to a polling place. Um, so I think that there is, um, there are so many ways that we can cover the actual act of voting and showing young people how to do it so, so they aren't intimidated. Um, one of the other things that I talk about a lot when I talk about parents and kids is that I grew up, my dad was a history teacher. And so we grew up, current events was our dinner table discussion every night. And we were allowed to express our own opinions and, and, and it was really fun. And especially as we got older, we were allowed to all argue with each other and, and everything like that. And I think that if, um, you know, that if parents can, can do a little of that with their kids, you know, introduce current events, what's happening in the news, um, around even around the dinner table, that that little bit can can do so much to build kids' civic knowledge. I, I actually want to jump in with it. Might end up being a question. I'm not sure, but um, I I understand that and appreciate all of this and think it's really critical. What what I'm backing up on and and I'm interested in, and I guess this will this will be related somehow to leadership is this transition that happened that, that you talked about, and I think it's really interesting, uh, seeing the purpose of school um, with kind of a balanced purpose of, of our, um, uh, of, a, of a civics responsibility and a in, in service of our, of, of individual growth. 
move more towards just a focus on individual success. Mm -hmm. And there isn't anybody in schools who would question whether or not we're going to teach math or we're going to teach English or we're going to teach science. But there's going to be a huge question of whether we should be teaching this at the at the uh, at a leadership level, at an inst school institution level. And what I'm wondering, Holly, if, you, if in your research any of this has surfaced or from anybody on the panel, is what, how do we how do we envision what are what are the mech, what are the levers that need to be pulled to take what we all think intuitively, and I think there are a, a lot of people in this camp that yes, we do need to move in this direction. But what levers need to be pulled where this becomes more formal and where we now see that, yes, this is a piece of good and necessary education. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Craig, you want to you comment? I just I, I couldn't agree more. I think that for all of us and for probably most people who would listen to this conversation, it's not. Um, it's not about the why, it's more about the how. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you've given us some really great sort of concrete ideas on the how, but you know, I can start with this. I don't understand why the voting age is 18. There's absolutely no reason why a 17 year old or 16 year old is not um, educated and informed um, enough and important enough to be a part of that process. Mm -hmm. There are many countries where the voting age is 16, as an example. We should start with that assumption. And going back, I think, to Bob's point, you know, what is, in, in your point, Holly, about what is the point of school? In the beginning, it was very much about raising citizens. We've gone far away from that. Why don't we bring that conversation back? And not just, you know, in conversation, but actually, okay, what are the incentives and what are the structures in place to, to reinforce what we're saying? So if, if a child or if a student cannot, by the time they leave high school or college, speak concretely about ways that they have been involved in their community, about real world issues that they're actively engaged in, the way that their education connects to those issues and to their passions. If they can't speak to those things, um, you know, well beyond their grades and their math scores and all those things, then, you know, we're not going to make progress. You know, uh, yeah. as a system, there's just no progress on the horizon. Uh, you know, schools, you know, going back to this issue of, of schools teaching one way and then another way, you know, this binary notion that schools were either teaching for citizenship or they had to prepare kids for college and career and, and test them, which is a, a binary notion. I mean, the two are combined, you know, American education has always swung back and forth in these polls. If, if we think of preparing for a career and competing globally as synonymous with learning how to be a good citizen and what citizenship is, you know, I mean, one of the questions I just noticed in the um, in the chat is, you know, how can I encourage my teachers to embed this kind of work in my curriculum? You know, and I remember Bob, this 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 is a flashback to last year, last year's uh, ethical forum. You know, I guess the simple answer is demand it of your teachers. You know, <laughs> students have to begin to demand things of their teachers. You know, you, you don't have to encourage them, you have to demand it, even though that sounds very aggressive. I mean, students play a real role in this. And then Craig, I, I just, I was tempted to go back to the how and the why. You, you asked, you know, everyone agrees the why, but, but Holly, you said something very interesting. You said, people don't understand what kind of country we live in, right? Isn't that something you said? Yes. And I think that's, that's part of the core of the problem. I'm not sure people know. Mm -hmm. I mean, your statement assumed that there was a common sense uh, that just that a common knowledge that people didn't understand about what kind of country we lived in. Right. I think I think we have a big problem now, and then I think many people do not know what kind of country we live in, or they have completely different visions of what kind of country we live in. So I think there is a why as well um, that is more disturbing and harder to get at because how is strategic, you know. We can, we can probably agree on that. And finally, Holly, I just wanted to bring up the News Literacy Project, which I'd add is the fourth. Oh, year. love News Literacy Project. They're so good. So that would be the fourth thing I'd put on your list of Stanford Project Civ in action. Um, I'm on the National Advisory Board there and they're doing some really good work.
So. They really are. And I actually wrote an article for the Times Education Supplement about News Literacy Project. Oh, They're right. amazing. Right. So well, a great thing to do is to teach young people and grown-ups for crying out loud, how journalism works, yes. that, you know, and what are real journalistic outlets and what are not real journalistic outlets and teach them the difference. Yeah. Um, this is so crucial to being able to even get current events, you know, that, so we're all living at least on the same reality plane. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great. Great. I love the news and news literacy project. Ah, uh, good. Someone put it up there. Great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Great. Marta, were you, were you going to comment? Yeah, I, I think, well, so Holly, thank you for uh, for this introduction. I love when you were talking about and uh, naming the different uh, disciplines too and, and how the mission has been changing. But what that made me think is, you know, sometimes I feel that civic education is a little bit boxed and it is a responsibility of history, geography, right. and civics classes. But I would argue that it needs to be present in every single class and every single course. So when you were talking about STEM, it makes me think, well, civics belongs to STEM, to science courses. How do we educate students and how do we equip them with the skills so they can be informed and take a stance and support their arguments with evidence that comes from science? And I think really for, for us or as educators, it is a responsibility to bring that civic knowledge, to bring that civic skills and hone those attitudes and all across the board um, at schools and communities and, and build those connections rather than just history, civics, that's your responsibility. We can check that off of the list. It is so true. And I mean, you know, we've had so many issues come up just this year that have to do with civics and science and the intersection of, of civics and science and how important that is. And in, um, in the Edutopia article and in the book both, I really talk about how this is not the responsibility of history teachers, that really to do a good job is it needs to be um, implemented into all subject and STEM is, is a huge part of that. Absolutely. I will tell you, there's so much to digest here. Um, and, I, and I want to go back to something Peter said <laughs> to the students. I, I know Peter, and I'm not surprised his, um, his direction was to demand it. And, um, and, and, of course, and I love that. Uh, but what I'm interested in is why are parents not demanding it? Why are taxpayers not demanding it of their schools? Um, and if we want to talk about uh, independent schools, why, why aren't the board of directors saying, hey, this is, we need to talk about what it means to be well-educated. But why isn't it happening at that level? I, I'm, I'm interested in what people think about that because I think we've got to get a deeper understanding of that um because that really is making this happen i think as we I'll, you know Peter, I, think, Peter, I think people are afraid i think they're afraid of the politicization of, of politicization i always have trouble pronouncing that word of, of, of civics they're afraid as happened with the american history curriculum uh that um, uh, that there is an understanding of what, that there isn't an understanding of what kind of country we live in, and then there'll be a vicious kind of turn to uh, an uncivil debate, you know? So I think it's, I think when it comes to parents, I think it's, and boards, I think it's fear. Huh. Kathy, you've, uh, and Kathy, you're on mute. Oh, there you go. I just took myself off. Right. I, I was trying to figure out how to bring up the elephant in the room, and Peter just brought it up. I think that with all of the uh, shifting of the tides of racism and in, in which is embedded in all of our documents and so on, we have to figure out a way to um, do what Peter and what Holly said, because these are very important. And maybe we have to, we have to put that in a context of racism and as, or that there are fundamental pro fundamental pieces of our civics education that have to be looked at and have to be acknowledged 
and then if it's more about when we I think Holly really covered a lot of this because she's talking about you know how do you have civil discourse among kids when there is such a political division or such a division about racism and so on so we've got the means to maybe address this but we have to acknowledge the problem first no. You know, I want to uh, animate that a little bit with a, a, a quick little story that, that uh, just a couple of months ago, I, I heard a, um, a wonderful, she's a wonderful person, wonderful teacher, math teacher, but say to me that she doesn't have the, um, the patience to talk with students about politics. And she was, and, and it was, it was beautiful kind of transparency saying that because I have such strong views myself is what she said. And it was this, it was, it, it, it was, I think saying that I, I can't talk about politics without being political. And, and I, I do think there is, you know, one place to look is the training of teachers, mm. you know, as, as Marta was saying, if this, and, and I think Holly was saying this too, if this is to be um, really more the, of the ethos of schools, and if all teachers from all grades and all disciplines are to be able to apply this to their particular disciplines or their particular age, it really has to be something that's fundamental to the training, the understanding, the passion, if you will, of educators. I, I also think that it has to do with how we think about what we do with our educations and about how much individual achievement is embedded in how we think about what is good for society. And I'm wondering if we have to shift that a little bit and say that when we think about our whole community, we are thinking, we are making society better. We have kind of been told, and I think that that's part of the laziness that a lot of families feel about addressing these kinds of issues is that we have been told that when we are individually successful that we make society better. And it's the scale has tipped way, I mean, which is, you know, which is right until it gets like this, until we're so far over on the individual achievement um, that, that we forget that we also have to pay attention to, to the larger community. That's it. And so because the system right now is so much about getting ahead as opposed to getting along or doing better collectively, um, we, have to, we have to go back and talk about the incentives. And if, if for example, universities are not um, truly expecting students to be able to speak to their real world you know, engagement and impact, if employers aren't asking those questions, if it's not tied to real world incentives, um, it's gonna be hard for the, there be a real movement. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, maybe that's the true. silver lining of this pandemic is that uh, some people will start thinking about that more. You know, if there is a silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> this makes me think too about, um, what is community engagement? What is authentic community engagement? If um, a student participates in a, I don't know, myriad of uh, service learning opportunities or community service projects, are those projects really aimed at improving community? So who is the beneficiary in this case and why the student is doing what they're doing? And I think that perhaps goes, goes back to this idea that you mentioned the um, action civics or the youth participatory action research, right? So really looking at what does the community need versus this is what I'm doing for the community and really acknowledging that who is the beneficiary and understanding whether what is the help that they need rather than this is what I'm offering. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Or this is what I'm doing for my resume, <laughs> right? Which is or, implied, I think, yeah. Well, or there is ahead, as Craig said, right? The get ahead versus getting along, right? The right. no sum game versus the Commonwealth, right? Right. right. And there's Holly, in, Holly, in your work, um, what, 
have you come up with um have you seen that kind of movement to uh, uh, to finding the leverage points the as, as craig was talking about the incentives um to move school districts or maybe full um, independent schools have you seen pressure coming from from different from legislatures from legislatures so um what happened was i think 2016 and 2018 for different reasons scared the crap out of a lot of politicians sure. um, that they uh, you know have told me that they get the phone calls from their constituents that are so incredibly uninformed um, that they have started introducing bills to put money behind civics education. So that's where I see movement. Um, the campaign for the civic mission of schools also, which was Sandra Day O'Connor's um, organization that is still going, they just introduced um, a federal bill to put some money behind civics education, because what I hear most, and I know many of you are from independent schools, but in the public school system, you know, basically, if it doesn't get tested, then it doesn't get taught. So there has to be some funding. I mean, talk about incentives, um, Craig, there has to be some funding behind these initiatives in order for them to really get a district wide um, a, a push. You know, then there are people like I'm thinking about Edie Hirsch, you know, who just wrote a wonderful book called um, How to Educate a Citizen which is about you know, a national curriculum. It's the one thing that we are terrified of doing. Right. But to get us all speaking the same language on some really basic facts of US government and US history and what our history, the reality of what our history really was would go a really long way um, in that we could have a national conversation that is all based on the same facts. <laughs> Yeah, which is also, probably just so fundamental to the challenge. Yeah. Right. In such a pluralistic. Yes. You know, right. Yeah. And how to keep it pluralistic. And, but still, we all know, you know, what our country's about. Yeah. That's, that's such a fight. I think that that's one of the things, Kathy, Kathy, in your comment, that was part of that is yes, but we're looking at what our country is about and we are. <laughs> as revisionists now looking at that and saying, wait a minute, maybe this was about something else. Mm -hmm. well, that's what I was trying to say. I, but I, I appreciate what Holly said, because if we can expand the conversation, then everybody is beginning to feel in, in part of it. And so maybe we come, that's why I said it's an optimistic comment. We may come out of this with a much greater understanding and a much greater uh, of plurality in how that can really benefit the, the entire community. And, and I think Marge's, talk about the community and, and getting children and people involved in the community projects that for the betterment, if you will, if you feel it's the betterment, is one way of, of uh, really expanding that. People feel they have a, have a stake in it. If, if, yes. they're, if they're hurt and their things are realized and recognized. So I, there's a lot going on, but I feel I feel somewhat optimistic about all of this. With you know, with all of the voting going on and people saying okay, and you know what we have, as Bob knows, we have a bunch of teenagers in um, their middle teens or, or, or and young ones, and they're sitting around the tables now. They're not going off to their um, phones. They're no. sitting around the tables listening to the conversations that we have, and what and we we often talk in terms of history about what. As a grandparent, okay, that was what it was in the back back in the good old days. And so, what happens is they are. It's a, a process of education for them too. And what 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 certain issues are in the community, in, in particularly in Vail, um, and what what we can do and help to help you know bring this leadership into the civic. I think civics is so important. It, sure. it doesn't necessarily even be important here in the United States. It's important worldwide to see how different governments um, operate and why we want to keep a democracy. Uh, and there, there is such a reason to be optimistic because here's the thing that I found out is that it's coming whether we want it or not. I you know, know. Um, kids are now, American kids are such a mix of different cultures. My own kids are mixed race kids and a mix of religions and cultures and that they have grown up with this and they see it in such a different way. 
that I feel incredibly optimistic because it's not, it's unavoidable that they, that they have grown up with LGBTQ kids in their classrooms and their friends and their cousins and their, you know, that, that this diversity, this pluralism um, is already here. And so what we are seeing is a massive fight you know, the last, the last breath of the fight, because I think the new generation is going to be totally different. Oh. It's paradigmatic change. It is. And it's a really, I just want to point out a hopeful question from this student at Asheville, who's talking about encouraging his or her parents to exercise their right to vote. It's like an interesting reversal, right? <laughs> want some hope, you know, it's not, it's not like parents saying, you know, trying to encourage the kid to vote. Here's a kid saying, um, uh, my parents aren't voting. What do I do? You know, I just think that's really yeah. cool. So whoever you are, student at Asheville School, that's, uh, I don't know how to answer the question, but I find it hopeful that you're asking it. Yeah. And that is a great, uh, Kathy and Peter, those are great punctuation marks and uh, in, in, in Holly, a positive one. Um, and I don't think Pollyannish, I, I, I agree with you. I think the these hard tribal lines political tribal lines, we hope will begin to decay. Um, and we hope that some of that is gonna come through some of the, in the specific programs, but more in general programs that relate to literacy, whether it's literacy in the news, literacy of social media and so on, given giving this next generation um, an, an, an opportunity to be uh, a little more in control um, and, um, and I do think that's happening and time does help. Um, and, uh, and schools are surely the engine behind all of this. Um, so, um, yeah, let's end on that hopeful note. Uh, Holly, thanks so much for thanks, not only your work, but engage, engaging sure. us in, in, in this conversation and, you know, the very nature of, of ethics and ethical leadership is to uh, is to move this to action, um, and uh, not only for the people on the panel and the people that are uh, that are off screen right now, but this whole session will be produced and I think available in a week or two in a recorded form, um, and so that if you want to use this, for instance, in your classroom, if your teachers or with your families or with your businesses or so on, it could be a great prompt whether it's the whole session or whether it's Holly's introduction, um, but it could be a great prompt to get this discussion going, um, going further and beyond this. So um, Holly, thank you so much. Panelists, thank, thank you. Thank you so much and, and thank you for the great discussion. It was great. It was, it was, yeah. Okay, everybody have a good day. Bye-bye, thank everyone. you. Yeah.